Good morning, everybody. I'm Robert Doerr, president of AI, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all here this morning for this Ed and Helen Hintz book event. It's a series of events we're having about new books that come out. They've been a lot of fun. It's a great way to get uh, interesting authors into our building and onto our live stream presentations. And today we have the great pleasure of having former Congressman Will Hurd here, who's written a wonderful book, American Reboot, An Idealist's Guide to Getting Big Things Done. And um, we're just very pleased to have you. Uh, just a little background on Will. Will has, was the congressman from the 23rd District of Texas, which he told me earlier, and he wants everyone to know, has the largest portion of the border between Texas and Mexico of any other congressional district. So he knows that immigration issue extremely well. Uh, he's now at Allen and & Company uh, and is, has written a great book. He is a graduate of uh, Texas A&M uh, and lives in San Antonio. And welcome, Will. It's really thanks, great to thanks, have you. With thanks us. for having me on. Looking forward to it. Um, so you've written a book that, um, and I'll, let me. One other thing, we're going to have questions uh, later. And if you do have questions and you're on the live stream, you can submit your questions to Daniel.bring at AI.org, or on Twitter using the hashtag hashtag American Reboot AI. Um, but we'll get to questions in a while. I have lots of questions, and so. I'm hoping we have a really good conversation about all the issues facing our country. The book uh, says, and I think it delivers, that it's a serious book about serious issues, trying to get away from the cacophony of the political back and forth. And so we're going to go through those tough issues, and we're going to see where you come out on all of them. And, um, and so the first one that I wanted to talk to you about um, was the one that I alluded to in the introduction, and that is immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, Everyone is telling us there's a crisis on the border. Uh, you were the congressman from the district closest to the border. Uh, you also, I, I maybe should have mentioned, is an alumni of the CIA. You were a, a case officer or in the clandestine service. Um, and so he mentioned to me earlier that he's the only member of Congress who had ever actually stamped a visa in your role as a CIA officer. Um, what is, what is um, your answer to immigration? It seems like a crisis seems really bad, what would you do about it? So it, it is bad, it's, it's terrible, it's the worst that's, that it's ever been. And, and for some context, so um, when, I was, when I was in the agency, I stamped visas and I may or may not have um, traveled um, crisscross international board, borders in alias, right? That may or may not have happened. Um, and, and I represent a, a district, 29 counties, two time zones, 820 miles of the border, took 10 and a half hours to drive across my district at 80 miles an hour, which was the speed limit in most of the district. Yeah, it's fast uh, down there in Texas. Um, and, and, and so it was bad last year. It's, it's unprecedented now. So let, let's take some numbers. Last month, 220,000 people were apprehended in one month. In the first year of the Trump presidency, he deported a little bit over 200,000 people the entire year. DHS is predicting potentially up to 350 to 400,000 people coming through our border illegally a month. That's an insane, that's an insane number, okay? Now, what's driving it? Right now, it's, it's, it's bad policy. One of the things that is happening is everybody's treated, being treated as an asylum seeker. Asylum is very specific. You have to be one, a member of a protected class, and your government has to be persecuting you because you are part of that protected class, or the government is not protecting you from somebody who is persecuting you because you're part of that protected class. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something we, we should know. That's something the State Department should know country by country. Uh, yes. It's very you, specific circumstance involving 100%. a specific government. And having everybody treated that way is an advantage to them. It gives them a greater way to get in. Yeah. Or... Right. And, 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 so, and so, so you're having everybody that's showing up to the border basically saying, I have credible fear uh, in my yeah. home country. So that means the system has been overloaded. Now, what's supposed to happen is a individual, that person, that Border Patrol, has the authority, has the statute, the, the, the statute authority to say, no, that's not credible fear, fear and you need to get deported right away, right? Which is, which is this debate around Title 42. Title 42 um, said 
despite all those things about credible fear or whatever, you can deny someone for a health reason, even if they had credible fear. Mm -hmm. So, so, but, but you actually don't need that statute because the, the power exists for Border Patrol to not take someone in or to deport them immediately. So stop treating everybody as, as an, an asylum, asylum seeker, seeker because that is hurting people that actually have asylum claims. And if you look historically, I think over the last 30 years, um, when people seek asylum coming to our southern border, only about 20% get granted um, as actual asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so point one. Point two, it is really hard to get from Tegucigalpa to El Paso, Texas. The infrastructure that has been created to move people, not, you know, historically... South of the border. South of the border. Historically, we always talked about the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. Historically, that has driven like 75 to 80% of the illegal immigration um, coming to the United States. Now, it's, it's all over the place. People mm -hmm. all over the world, but they're, they're transiting through Central America. Now... The difference between human traffickers, human smugglers, and terrorists. Terrorists have to do something once, right? Mm -hmm. Human smugglers, human traffickers, they have infrastructure that has to be reproduced. You have to show up. You have to provide buses. You have to provide halfway houses. You have to accept money. You have to, and you have to replicate this. Oh, and by the way, if you get deported, you get a second chance. Usually, most of the human smugglers give you two chances. So there is a ton of infrastructure that we know about. Border Patrol is actually doing a very good job of technical analysis of people's phones and, and mm -hmm. asking these questions. Yeah. And we're not doing enough to dismantle the networks that are operating. Now, um, Abigail Spanberg and I, in my last year in Congress, tried to pass a piece of legislation that forced the intelligence community to report to Congress how much, in, you know, uh, foreign, how much intelligence they were collecting on human smugglers, human trafficking, and narco traffic, uh, the, uh, drug smugglers. And because prior to us introducing that, the number was really low. And so, so let's start dismantling the infrastructure. That is, that is being used. Third point, a second point. Third point, in some places like the Northern Triangle, we have to address root causes. And that's violence, lack of economic opportunity, and extreme poverty. We know where, like, so, so why isn't State Department, USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, um, the new OPIC, I always forget the name of the new OPIC, whatever the new mm -hmm. OPIC is, um, them, and coordinating with American philanthropic organizations that are spending probably billions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. in those areas, why do we not have a coordinated national economic security plan for that region? And it should be over a 10-year horizon. We tried that in Mexico when, um, under um, President George W. Bush. Um, it was, they, they, it was, what was it called? Um, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, was, it was, they had a meetings in, in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, around this. But we need a longer-term plan. Oh, and by the way, part of that economic support requires them to take their people back, right, right. when they get deported, right? So, so, so that's, that's, that's the third. And the fourth. Yep, go the, ahead. Four, this is a you know, four-point plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Streamline legal immigration. Right. Streamline... Every industry needs workers. And, and, at, and at a time when we're thinking and potentially getting into a recessionary period, having more taxpayers in the workforce is a good thing. So all of these things that I talk about can be done at the same time, and, and that would reduce this pressure you're seeing. And, oh, and by the way, Democratic mayors, and I'm not trying to be political here, Democratic mayors, county judges, city council members along the border or just outraged with some of these things that are going on. So let's get political just for a second on that because you described a crisis situation, we're doing everything wrong, we're not addressing it. Is this one of those things where the, the Trump administration was doing a better job on, on solving the immigration problem in, um, uh, from South America than the Biden administration? Or is this both administrations' faults? So, so um, 
over the history of America and, and, and immigration policy, the Trump administration is not going to get an award. But the Biden administration is so incompetent that it makes the Trump administration look like they knew what they were doing. And they didn't, by the way. Um, and then one last follow-up on, on that, just to, on, on, on this. Texas is um, a place that apparently looks like it's full of a lot of people that are very upset about the immigration problem, which you just described, just like you. Governor Abbott has mm-hmm. sent a bus a load of people up here to make a point. Um, and yet Texas, of all the states in the union, has received more immigrants in the last 25 years than any other states, and Texas is doing great. Yeah, sure. So what's wrong with immigrants? There's nothing wrong with immigrants. Immigrants are great. It's been the foundation of our country, right? But, but most people are saying, do it legally, right? Illegal immigration that is taking advantage of a system impacts everybody. And so when you look at the number of, of businesses that have been started uh, by, by first-generation immigrants in Texas, the number is, is, is through the roof, right? And so, so it, th- th- there's not an issue. We have to be able to separate people that are coming here illegally versus people that have come here the right way and legally. And, and, and part of this is let's streamline the system. And, it's, and, it's, and, and for me, it's also a longer-term national security issue because when I look at the, the biggest challenge that's going to affect the United States of America is this new Cold War with the Chinese government. If the Chinese government is going to steal our technology, let's steal their engineers. If you're a Chinese kid and you're going to American University or Stanford or Texas A&M, and, you, and you're you getting a, 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 a master's in data analytics or artificial intelligence or cybersecurity, here's your visa. You're going to come work for an awesome American company, or you're going to start this company here. right? And so, so this is another piece that when we look at immigration, it is, it is complicated. And we should be talking about legal immigration, illegal immigration, border security, we got to accept all these things at the same time. Okay, so we've talked about immigration and, and diversity, and, and now we're going to talk a little bit about race. And a lot of uh, the early part of the book describes what you view as a problem with the Republican Party, mm-hmm. which is that it makes uh, it doesn't always make the right effort or the right step, or it steps all over itself in trying to bring new people into its party with a more diverse background. And yet earlier today, you mentioned to me in our conversation before that you're, you're feeling like the Hispanic vote for Republicans in the next midterm elections may reach record amount. Sure. So what's going on there? Are the Republicans making gains with uh, people who, aren't, who don't look like me, or are they falling further behind? What's your take on that? So, so um, uh, let's go back to 2020. South and West Texas, you had an increase of Latino votes for Republicans. Why? Two issues. 40% of folks that live along the border are connected to law enforcement in some form or fashion, whether it's Border Patrol. Border Patrol is the largest employer you know, in, in, in along the border. Then you add the sheriffs, and then you add local police. Then you add you know, uh, things like... Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, you add, there's a lot of, about People 40% connected to law enforcement. Okay. When one party is seen as anti-law enforcement, that impacts your, your, your job, your way of life. Because border security, if you live on the border, border security means public safety. And when you have people that are at night, you have 60 people coming through your property, going by your home, breaking into your cars, what are you going to do? And, and this is, this, these are Democratic mayors, county judges, and, and city council members that are like, this is unacceptable because of these right. federal policies. So these are the things, right? right. Now, my, my, hypo- my, my, my thesis is this. Imagine we were also seen as being supportive of these communities. Imagine that on top of the other side being so incompetent and having the best ideas. Even if you have the best ideas, if people don't think you like them, mm-hmm. they're not gonna listen to you, right? And, 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 and look, I, I have to, the question I get 
Uh, I'm always going on a tangent here. Yeah, go, go I, ahead. I, I've always hated labels all my life. Right. And, and that phrase moderate, right? up here in Washington, it's mean as a slight. It means squishy. Oh, so there's language. legitimate reason for that, but that's but no, okay. No, no, yeah. no, 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 but no, that's bullshit, right? Because here's why. Here's why. We're the ones that actually have to take ideas to communities that do not like you. It is easy preaching to the choir. It is easy talking to this crowd because guess what? We agree on 90%. You go to a colonia in El Paso. Most people here don't even know what a colonia in El Paso is. Think favela from Brazil and talk about conservative value. And the first time they look at me, they're like, you're a black Republican? What? Right? Right? And so, so for me, I had, to do, I had to get involved in the biggest fights, right? I'm the one that had to go in and take message to places that had never taken it. And, and unfortunately, in this place, when I'm talking about Washington, D.C., for the last 30 years, we think the best way to govern is by single party rule. And so instead of trying to grow our coalitions, we try to eke out that little bit of the existing one. That's insane. Grow the pie bigger. And we have an opportunity in black and brown communities. We have an opportunity in, in, with, with women in, with college degree in the suburbs. We have an opportunity with people under the age of 35. But we can't be perceived as a-holes, misogynists, homophobes, and Islamophobes or, or religious phobes, whatever you want to call them, right? And I'm not saying the entire party is. I, I, I have to defend the party on these things. Because the majority of the party is not. The people that I know, the voters that I mm-hmm. interact with, they are not those things. But we are perceived that way because of a handful of individuals that hijack the image, right? And, and here, here's what if, so let's take my, my home state. We control voting. Like Republicans are in control. Yeah. So if there was a problem with the voting system, that means we were the ones doing it. Right? Yeah. And, and so, so that, that doesn't make sense. Now, here's, here's my opinion. Yeah. On voting in the on United voting. States. Let's make it as easy as possible to vote. We should, we should be able to register online. We should be able to... Uh, look, I've been shocked. Texas has two weeks of early voting. Right? Yeah. Eight to eight, on the weekends. I'm shocked that there's a lot of states that don't have anything near that when it comes to, when it comes to early voting. Okay. So there is, this, there, is this, there is this also this narrative, especially in the media, that some of these things that Texas was doing was trying to make it harder to vote. Uh, but, 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 but look, we still have, it's, it's still a place, it beats a number of other states to include uh, liberal states right. in the, the, the ease of being able to, to vote. Now, I also come from... Um, a, an area of town, if, if you're a Texan, or an area of the state, and if you're a Texan, you may know this, um, from the old George Parr area. This is Box 13 and how LBJ got elected center. <laughs> okay. If you don't know the story. It's old history. Yeah. It's old history. Yeah. But they were stuffing ballots right. in, in the ballot box, right? And, and, and LBJ won by 13 votes. Right. right? Uh, no, he won by like 19 votes because of one box that had all these dead people. I had people come to me when I first started running, I can get you 117 votes, or I can get you 109 votes. I can get you 127 votes, right? These were folks that were ultimately abusing the system, right? So, so I'm aware of people that have contacted me to try to do that. So, so is this stuff happening? Yes, right? Um, <clears throat> but let's make it easier for people to vote. And let's, let's lead with that. But also, we should be able to v- verify that an individual is who they say they are. This, the, all of these things can be true at the same time. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, um, a, or, a or issue. So two follow-up on this. Harvesting absentee ballots? Uh, yeah, I, I, no, them? I don't think you should be able to do that. Okay. And um, is the president's rhetoric about what's going on in voting brings us back to Jim Crow America? Is that right or wrong? Which President Biden will oh, say President that, Biden. that okay. if the Republicans oh, okay. had their yeah. way, no, uh, it's with not this... Jim Crow. My father, my father's from East Texas, a place called Marshall. 
Marshall was the second most important area in the, in the, for the Confederacy outside of Richmond. When um, Jefferson Davis thought the, you know, his days were numbered, they were going to relocate to Marshall, Texas. And so after the Civil War, Reconstruction in Texas was centered in Marshall. And so, so this is one of the reasons why my dad's actually a Republican, because his, his father and his grandfather got exposed to a lot of Republicans through Reconstruction in, in the, in the um, East. But it's also the place where the first white primaries got started in Texas, right? Okay. And Jim Crow got started there. My dad always tells a story about, yeah, you would go and vote, and they would, you would put it in a drum, like a, like a, a barrel, mm -hmm. and they would light it on fire. Like the black folks had to put their votes. Like, that's not happening. Okay. And, and so, so to me, I think when you use that kind of rhetoric, it's, it, um, it, 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 it uh, lessens what many of our forebears had to go through. Um, sometimes when you talk about the language that you use that Republicans look like, uh, I think you use transphobe and homo homophobe. Uh, that issue has come up most recently in these discussions about uh, what should be taught in schools sure. and parents' efforts to involve themselves in the selection of curriculum, especially for kids younger than the third grade. Yeah. And um, some people are saying that that effort on the part of conservatives or Republicans or parents um, makes them look uh, like they're homophobes. Yeah. I mean, that's what your rhetoric would sort sure. of remind me of. So is, is that? No, but, but, but we, we got to lead with, right? When you, when you got to lead with, don't discriminate against anybody. But also, we shouldn't be teaching sex ed to third graders. Right? Like, the, both of those things can be true. And, and so, so how you articulate these things is, is, is oftentimes it gets taken advantage of and, and, and gets abused, and we have to recognize that and understand that and lead with the most important principle, the most important principle, don't discriminate against people, right? Okay. And, then, and, then, and then, you can, then you can move on. Okay, last question on schools' sure. uh, choice. There's a, some rhetoric in the book, although I'm not sure. Are you pro-choice? Are you pro more options for parents to 100%. make their own decisions? 100%. Look, we, we, have, we have income inequality because we have education inequality. Texas has... I don't know of, of, of other longitudinal studies on the choice issue, but Texas did a 20-year study on kids that were going into charter schools. Black and brown kids eliminated the achievement gap from their white counterparts. This is, like, this should be our issue. And, and this is, look, and if I'm being critical, this should be, every think tank should be championing this and using this study and showing how this is something that, that really matters. Choice and charter schools. Choice and charter schools, Which is right? a direct affront to the Democratic Party's commitment to the teachers' union. For sure. But, but also, public schools should be able to have the same freedom and flexibility that charter schools do. I, like, I, I'm a proud product of Texas public schools. And a high school in NIS, Northside Independent School District, the fourth largest school district in, I think, in the, in the state, um, one, one high school should be able to have, that principal should be able to do things a little bit differently than the principal from another high school in that same school district. And, and so we should be making sure that they have the same freedom and flexibility that many, that many kids in, in charter do. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super supportive of this initiative because ultimately, um, if we, if we re eliminate that achievement gap, then you're going to be able to see um, income inequality um, in, in, improve. And then also... We, look, we shouldn't be teaching kids the same way I was taught mm -hmm. or the way my folks were taught. My dad's 89 years old. And come on, like, we have to make sure that we're preparing kids now for jobs that don't exist. 40% of high schools across the United States of America do not have a computer science class. Now, one of the trends in technology is no code development, right, where you don't have to learn Java or Ruby on Rails or all those kinds of things. But this is a foundational thing that is going to impact every single industry um, in the future. And 60% and and, and of our schools don't have it? That's crazy. And so, so yes, I, I actually believe that this is an issue that can help the Republican Party grow in the communities 
that where, where we haven't been successful. And when I was knocking on doors in, in primarily overwhelmingly Latino and overwhelmingly um, Democratic areas, and I knock on someone's door and they're like, why should I vote for you? I'm like, are schools important? Yeah. Are your schools good? They're like, no. I was like, how long have your schools been bad? 25 years. Do you know who was responsible for that? No. Okay. The 25 years of Democratic leaders. Try okay. something different for your schools. So another issue in which you differentiate a little bit with the sort of uh, caricature of the Republican Party is on climate in mm -hmm. the book. It's a little, it strikes me. Maybe I've got it wrong. Sure. But do, do you, I mean, you mentioned energy a moment ago, and you talked about, you know, rhetoric coming from the president and his people that was very anti-energy, mm -hmm. and that sounded sort of classically Republican. But, but where, 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 where's the balance there? Where's the... Look, climate change is real. Like, like humans are having an impact on the environment. Period, full stop, right? But c can we get to net zero emissions with hydrocarbons? Yes. Okay, there's, there's also a issue where you have, it's like, I'm gonna say, it's, don't fact check me, but it's almost about like two billion people that don't have access to clean water um, or, or electricity, right? Like, there are, still, there are still communities burning dung for power. In 2022, that shouldn't be the case, right? So uh, many of these communities should be able to jump from burning dung to having some kind of cleaner fuel source, which includes natural gas, right? And so, so uh, for, for me, it is, you know, any, in all the above energy policy includes uh, nuclear, it includes uh, oil. Look, most oil companies and, and energy companies are like, hey, we should be doing something against methane, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we should be doing something against, uh, for carbon capture, right? Like there, there's this weird narrative that, you know, uh, the, you know that industry is not interested in doing it. And, and, and our ability to become more energy secure is critical to our, our national security po uh, posture. It was, it was Texas shale company. Mm -hmm. That broke the back of OPEC, mm -hmm. right? Like the, 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 the Saudi Arabia, Middle East, even Russia does not have the same control and influence over our economy as they did in the 70s, partly because of the shell revolution that happened in the East. So like, like most issues, everybody wants to break it down to an or issue. Mm -hmm. It's either this, A, or, or, or B. No, it's like these things are complicated and require complicated solutions um, that actually require us to have some kind of thought and mm -hmm. back and forth on, right? So, so I actually don't think, what, what, here's what I've learned about climate. I've spoken to a lot of college campuses. If you're under the age of 35 and you're Republican, you're talking about this issue and about, about having to be thoughtful on it. So let's put forward some thoughtful ideas um, on, these, on these things. Oh, and by the way, I think, acknowledge that there's an issue, yeah, that, but well, don't uh, ruin our economy to yeah, deal with it. Yeah, like, no, it's, 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 it's crazy. Create an economy in which when, when these other things become um, uh, cheaper and more accessible, then they're, going to be, then they're going to be adopted. And how do you make something cheaper and more accessible? Create competition around it, right? Like, this is, this is the, so, 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 yes, like, I actually don't think this, this philosophy is, is, is so outside of where most people are. I'm just not afraid to talk about it. Okay. Right? Because there's this, this idea you fear that, oh my God, like... You might be perceived yeah. as a... Yeah. And look, I, I, start, I start one of the chapters in the book about this experience I had in Mexico City. Yeah. Look, I, I, I'm, I, I, um, I had never really been outside of Texas. And my freshman year, I was a computer science major. And I'm walking across campus and I see a sign that says, take two journalism classes in Mexico City for $425. I had 450 bucks in my bank account, <laughs> so I go to Mexico. <laughs> um, fell in love, I thought it was cool, seeing things I only read about in books. And I'm in Mexico City, this is like, I'm like six weeks in. And I walk out of the house I was staying in, I'm like, what's wrong? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, something's weird. I'm like, what's happened? Mm -hmm. I didn't know Mexico City was surrounded by mountains because the smog was so bad. 
that you couldn't see the maps, yeah. right? And I had never done any research. This was, this was before Wikipedia. You know, you still yeah. had to get, like, Lonely Planet. They probably don't even know what Lonely Planet is, right? <laughs> this is, like, Lonely Planet books, right? Okay. And, and then it was a one clear day. And, and you've seen how Mexico City, what, like, I think, fourth largest city yeah, in the yeah. world, um, has, has addressed that issue from 1996. Um, so progress can be made. Yeah, progress yeah, can be yeah. made. So another area in the book which you describe in some detail is your attitude towards certain uh, social policy um, and safety net programs. Um, and you tell a story about you were, I think, maybe one of the few Republicans who voted not to repeal Obamacare. Is that right? I got sure, that right. Great, yeah. And I think you did it based on Medicaid, uh, the need for Medicaid in, in Texas. And uh, you tell a story about the call you got from the President of the United States, uh, Donald Trump. You want to just tell us about how you came to that opinion and the story of the call? Look, um, it's, I, I get asked a lot of questions like, were you ever, you know, <laughs> were you ever pressured? No, because yeah. everybody knew. What's a call? When, when I'm a yes, you know that. I was a yes when I was a yes, and I'm a no when I was a no. Okay. Right? And if I didn't know, I'll get back to you when I become a yes or a no. Right? Okay. It's, it's real simple. And so, so on the, on the, on the, on the issue of, uh, of, of Obamacare, it didn't, so the goal of Obamacare was to decrease costs and increase access to health care. Obamacare mm. did not do that, right? When you increase premiums where you're like, your premium is like eight to $10,000, that's not having you know, affordable health care, right? That's it pretty- did increase access. I mean, it, it, it did increase, it didn't it, decrease costs, but it did increase access. Access to, to, to insurance. insurance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. not health care. Okay. Fair. Right? Fair. Uh, yeah. I'm talking about health care. Quality health care. And, and so, so, so it's not like I'm saying I'm for it. I got okay? it. But taking $90 billion out of Medicare is not fixing Medicare. Yeah. And, and so, so, look, I, so I, was, I was a no early on. And to be a team player, I told my man, Pablo Ryan, I said, I said Paul, <laughs> um, I am, I'm a no. Here's five things you can do <laughs> to change my opinion. Yeah. Um, but I was like, I'm going to hold my statement because anything I say will be used against everybody else, right? right. And so he said, fine. And then, and then um, uh, Vice President Pence one to meet. Yep. And, and so we, um, we... Former governor knows former the go- importance of go- Medicaid funding governor, for state. Former absolutely. So we meet, and, and this is, you know this is when they're twisting your arms when they're like, no staff. Just you and the vice president. No, and all his staff, by the way. Oh, like, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was... No and, staff for and, you. Yeah, mm-hmm. no staff for me, yeah, right? Because yeah, right? yeah. they knew this is like, they're going to try to trick you. And, yeah. and, and you, had, you had the head of CMS there. And then I knew they were they were playing they were they were um, SEMA uh, yeah SEMA was there and and I knew they were playing they were playing they were going they were going to twist my arms hard because um, uh, why am I drawing blank former head of he was he was head of of HHS at the time uh, Tom Price Tom Price early it was early in the term former congressman I love Tom Price a good guy yeah. okay when I first ran the most successful fundraiser I had in Texas was with Tom Price. Mm-hmm. He always ribbed um, Paul Ryan and, and Kevin McCarthy about that because he raised more he money more than either one of those two, right? right? Anyway, so it's an aside. So they start twisting me. I said, are you taking $90 billion out of Medicare or not? Well, uh, uh. I said, Vice President, I have the most number of Medicare recipients in my district than any other member of Congress. He goes, Will, I understand. Thank you for your time. He shook my hand, right? He understood. Yeah, yeah. Then President mm-hmm. Trump calls. The first call, I don't think I put this in the book. Um, I get a phone call. Uh, my phone's ringing. It's like random time of the day. And it just says 202 dash. I've never seen that. Okay. Now, I don't we, answer, now we know. What yeah, is. I don't answer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't answer calls that. You don't know who it is. I don't know who it's from. Heck yeah. So I deny it. Yeah. 35 seconds later, my assistant's calling me. The president's trying to call you. The president's trying to call you. I was like. He's got 50 people over there. <laughs> they know how to call your scheduler and set it up. Anyways, right. we get it set up. And the first thing, I'm outside and wind's blowing. And I said, Miss President, I apologize. 
but um, you know, I'm outside. He goes, Will, you sound beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and then the conversation degenerated from there. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I would, we're going to come back to the former president in a little bit. Sure. But before we do that, I have two more big topics. And one is the uh, uh, President Biden's efforts to, because you talk a lot, you talk about your support for Medicaid and the need for funding for your state because you have so many Medicaid recipients. And, I, and we understand that. Um, and then you also talk about child care. Mm -hmm. And there, you, you have a lot of, about how you're a big supporter of the child care block grant and the child care tax credit, which is child care tax credit. During the last couple, since President Biden was elected, a big issue has been an expansion of the child tax credit that is not child care, it is just a direct cash benefit sure. from the IRS, regardless of whether people work or deal with a social worker or anything. And the Democrats made a big pitch for this um, in the Build Back Better plan to make that permanent. Mm -hmm. And it's really a, 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 de a defining element in their platform. Um, where are you on that? But you should have, there should be work requirements, right? Like, I, I, don't, I don't think that's hard to say. Um, and, and is this the only, look, part of this is why I think groups like y'all are, are so important. We gotta be thinking of other ways that we can address the problem. The problem is, how do we make sure that families that need some, that need to be able to take care of the kids so they can work, Let's figure out how we can do that, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Like, that's what we're trying to solve for, not some wonky update to, to something. But, but I think if we could expand that, then you, need, you should have work requirements, which I think is something that you guys have been, have mm -hmm. been advocating. Some of us, uh, not all of us, but yeah. Yeah. I have. But anyway, uh, now <laughs> let's talk about foreign policy. You're sure. a former CIA I am. Uh, person. Yeah. You clearly, in the book, you care a lot about mm -hmm. this. You have a reference to President Trump's foreign policy where you say, it's not America first. It wasn't really America first. It was America alone. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? So let's start with the Cold War with the Soviet Union, then Russia. Our economies were never equal. If, if you were to compare, if, if, if America was a basketball, Russia would have been a baseball. Right, in, in size comparison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our population was bigger. Right? We had some significant advantages over our near our peer rival Soviet Union. In that Union, great power competition. Russia, right? Yep. China is different. There are, some economists think their economy is larger than ours now already. Uh, it will be at some point. Obviously, their population is, is larger. Now, the difference between the uh, U.S. and China versus um, uh, America and Soviet Union and Russia, are, uh, the, the Chinese and American economies and cultures are intertwined in a way that we never were with the Soviets or the Russians. So the only way the United States of America is going to keep our position where our economy is the most important economy in the world mm -hmm. and we are the global superpower which provides our economy and our way of life a lot of positives, by the way, is by growing our posse to deal with threats like the Chinese government. And so I've come to a conclusion after being connected to the national security uh, community for more than two decades to a very simple, a very simple philosophy. Mm -hmm. Your friends should love you and your enemy should fear you. And there were things that when and, and, and President Trump's um, uh, foreign policy, right? When, when we look at, look, it's, it's, a, it's a great slogan, right? Don't get me wrong, it's a great slogan. But when you look at how it was actually articulated, we pissed off our friends, um, and, our, and, 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 and um, now I can make an argument that Russia didn't fear us under, under the previous administration, and they definitely don't fear us they definitely don't fear us now under, under Joe Biden, um, which is case in point for, for Ukraine. So my point in that, that statement is we need friends. We need allies. We need to engage in, in international organizations. We can't just get pissed off that the WHO does something and take our ball and go home. We have to stay and show leadership because these are the entities and the organizations that we have benefited from creating. The United States created 
the international order. And we supported the international order with our soft and our hard power. And the only way we're going to keep this international order that has led the American economy becoming the greatest economy and the envy of the world is if we engage. And that's hard, right? Mm -hmm. our, our, sometimes our friends are pains in the rear. Mm -hmm. But we have to stay and engage. And they have to know that we're going to have their back, right? And, and so that's my philosophy. And that's why I think what's happening now, and Ukraine is a perfect example, when, when President Zelensky is like, hey, thanks for what you've done, but you're not doing enough, mm -hmm. that's an example of your friends not loving you. And the fact that, that, that Vladimir Putin is going to continue to escalate and, and cause death and destruction, it's a sign that he, he is not afraid of us or the consequences to his, to his actions. And so, so for me, what I think, should, we should be giving every single heavy weapon the Ukrainians can handle, period, full stop. Look, I don't think we need boots on the ground at, at this point, but we should, imagine if we were giving the Ukrainians everything they needed for the last eight years. Would things be a little bit different than they are now? Absolutely, but folks would be like, well, this is gonna lead to escalation. We can't predict what he's gonna do. You cannot, nobody has ever gotten second, third, fourth, fifth order of effects right. So come back to first principles. Prevent the unnecessary massacre of innocent people. And so, we could be doing more. Uh, I just want to go back to the Trump foreign policy sure. because the book, there's a sort of subtle uh, sense in the book, maybe not so subtle, that, that you are differentiating yourself from what might be called the Trump wing of the Republican Party. Yeah, um, sure. And I think it's an a big. Assessment. Okay, yeah. okay. So uh, let's just let's pursue that a little further. Yeah. Um, is it in foreign policy where your differentiation is the strongest? Is that where, is that really where, I mean, you know, President's comments about Russia or Putin even now are particularly troubling. Is, is it foreign policy where you're, because a lot yeah. of the other things you've mentioned really don't sound too different than well, the sort well, of look, typical like, Republican. Let's, let, we, all, we, all, we talk about the, the, the Trump taxes. It wasn't the Trump tax hike, the Trump tax, tax, cut. tax cut. It was... The Paul Ryan tax cut, right? Like it was Paul's, it was Paul's idea and brainchild, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of these, a lot, some of the domestic stuff was things that had, had, you know, in essence, been on the shelf for, for, a, for a long, long time. for a long time. Um, I think this, this um, isolationist um, foreign policy, and, and that's it's not unique to Donald Trump, right? Um, I would say the political spectrum is no longer a line. It's actually a horseshoe. And the extremes are closer to each other than they are to yeah. the middle. Okay. And so this, uh, this isolationist um, uh, uh, foreign policy has... Uh, look, I can make an argument that America has been isolationist more than it hasn't, right? Um, however, when after World War II, when we lend a happy hand to, to Europe, this is where uh, America became a, a true superpower and, and ultimately our economy took off. So, so I, I would say I am, I am not an isolationist. George Washington was right when he told us, don't get into entangling alliances, y'all. You know, that's gonna be a problem. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed since then. And the world is so interconnected that us thinking that something that happens somewhere else is not gonna impact us, is just absolutely wrong. Oh, and by the way, it's a fraction of the cost to solve the problem somewhere else before it gets to our shores. You know, see the first conversation we had on, on, on illegal immigration. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna, sure, that, sure. That, that this isolationism aspect of the Trump foreign policy and its re reluctance to be supportive or, mm -hmm. or reaching out to its friends yeah. um, is something that really is a, like a serious problem for you. Um, but I want to press a little more. Um, how else would you differentiate yourself from uh, Trump politics? Uh, look, I, th that's a hard question for me to answer. I've not sat here and said, okay, what do all... Like, but but here, in the book, the, I'll, I'll things, give you, I'll give you a hint. I believe, yeah. Sometimes you say, you have this phrase, don't be a jerk. Yeah. Uh, that's not a sort of typical policy wonk line. Um, what are you talking about? When you say don't be a jerk, what is it? Is it is it Marjorie Green? Is it this Cawthor? Yes, it's the it's the way we talk, right? Okay. Like the, the the way we talk, the 
you know, assuming that everybody who doesn't agree with you is a traitor or again, like, like that's, that's not how normal people think. And this is not how, you know, people that are, that are in positions of leadership should be talking about. And, and, and look, the, the other thing I always talk about is make sure your audio and your video match. The things you say should be reflective in, in the things that you do. And, and so, so for me, I, 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 you know, it's more than just style. It's, it's also substance. Um, and so it's, it's like, I don't like, I, I need, I guess I need to define better what it means to be a jerk. Um, yeah. yeah. But, well, I don't, but, I don't want to press you too hard yeah, no, on that, no, no, but no. I, it's but not, I, not, I do not, think that, 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 that the, you know, there's a lot of great ideas sure. a lot of good substantive mm-hmm. policy ideas. They strike me as being, you know, you're a, you were a former Republican congressman from Texas. No, I'm a, I'm a Republican. Yeah. Former congressman. Yes. That's, from Texas. that's yeah. okay. Yeah, that's yeah. my You're point. Get me in trouble. The, the sort of moderate thing doesn't really work with me. You know, this is a pretty standard conservative book. Look, because uh, look, I I don't use that phrase to describe myself. Like I actually think I am conservative. Yeah. Okay. And I take okay. These, fine. Right. I take these I All take right. these messages to to yeah. places that haven't had it. Right? Exactly. And and, 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 and it turns out they go over well. They do, of course. That's the yeah. point. That's yeah. how a black Republican got elected in a seventy one percent Latino district. Yeah, there there go. <laughs> okay, let's open it up for questions from the audience. We have one right here. Uh, uh, wait for the mic. It's coming. The uh, uh, the. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask, are there any institutional changes in Congress or mm-hmm. the electoral system that would promote more substantive policymaking sure. and less being a jerk? <laughs> yeah, see, he knows what a jerk is. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so, so if I had a magic wand, and then I'm gonna get to not having a magic wand, but let me, let me start with the magic wand. If I had a magic wand, I would not make any district more than plus six in either direction, right? A um, plus six, so 56% Republican or 50% Democrat, to me is a jump ball in November, right? So anybody can win. And when you go back to 2020, only 34 seats in the House were competitive. And, and I define competitive as in the previous presidential election, people voted for one party of president and the other party for the House. That number in 2000 was, was north of 70, I believe. And in 1980, it was north of 150. And so I think competition in November creates problem solvers, not bomb throwers, right? So if I had a magic wand, I'd say that's what you would do. I don't have a magic wand, and 50 states aren't going to make those, those changes between now and 22 or 24, or probably even 26. So what needs to happen? We need more people voting in primaries. The last non-presidential election year, 54,000 people voted in a contested primary on both sides. That's crazy. That means 26,501 people decided 92% of the seats in the House, which is wild. My, my district, north of 260,000 people, would vote in a general election. So more people voting in primary. But structurally here in Congress, um, I think concentration of power in the hands of a few is always a bad thing. Whether the far right wants to do it in an individual or the far left wants to do it in the government, Congress has concentrated its power in the leadership. Now, uh, Paul tried to push it down back to, to chairman. And when chairman and ranking members were making decisions, right, and they took more um, interaction from their members than they did their own party. And so 20 years ago, the, appro- the appropriations chair wrote the appropriations bill, right? And they would tell the speaker or the majority leader to, you know, go fly a kite if they were trying to get involved in that process. So, so I think um, uh, pushing it, and, 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 and structurally how you do this, I, I don't know the answer because it's just a matter of people in those leadership positions um, giving that power to those individuals to make those decisions. I think that would change a lot to where you actually truly have a, a real competition of ideas because I think the conversations, I, I, the conversation we should be having, especially with things around technology's roles in society, are, are going to make some of the fights we've had here look like pillow fights, right? Um, I'm on the board of a company called OpenAI, and we're, we're seeking artificial general intelligence. Um, AGI is an algorithm that can do something better than most people in a thing, right? We just introduced a technology called Dolly, where you can put in text, and it produces an image. 
It doesn't search the internet for that image. It goes pixel by pixel and creates a new image. Now, we put things in place to prevent that from being used uh, for deep fakes. The Chinese government's not going to do that, right? So these are some of the kinds of technologies that are going to be, you know, a, a life altering when it comes to biotech. You know, the fact that you know, I think you know, the, the increasing the average, um, you know, number of years somebody lives, right? Like that's going to happen in our in our in our time. So we need to have some real competition and thoughtful ideas on how to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and and structurally, if we change the way Congress operates, we do that. Magic wand, 56%, plus, plus or minus six in one direction, or push power uh, down Two. your committee chairs. Another question? It's right there. Ma'am? Hi, I'm glad you mentioned technology. Uh, I know you were on the Aspen Institute's Disinformation mm -hmm. Commission. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, given the recent enthusiasm among a lot of Democratic politicians, most notably former President Obama, that uh, disinformation has become a new and urgent threat against democracy, and in particular, speak to some of the solutions that they're proposing and what they might mean for free expression. Uh, I, I can't say I can you know, talk about all the things that they're, 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 um, they're proposing as, as possibilities. Uh, disinformation is happening, right? Um, I think th looking at this from a national security issue from foreigners is an easier uh, thing to handle because it's clearer of whose responsibility it is to deal with those kinds of things. Um, you know, and, and, and my experience with disinformation is really around counterterrorism. And so you know how to uh, uh, do countering violent extremism. We know the payloads you should be delivering, who's trying to do this. So, so from, a, from our adversaries doing this, um, you know, making sure we understand the tactics, techniques, and procedures, and dismantling the, the infrastructure they have to do that, um, we're, we're getting much better at being able to do that. Now, uh, here in the U.S., right, and it, it's, I've, I've been, um, I've learned a lot about the First Amendment for participating in some of these disinformation <laughs> panels. Um, we should preserve that, uh, but also these platforms, when, when they, they're prioritizing saying crazy things, is that the priority we want for, for communication? I don't think that that is. Um, I, I also think that whenever there's a new piece of technology, we assume it's so different, it's so unique, it needs its own special rules. No, like social media companies are no different from newspapers. They're no different from TV, right? It's just the infrastructure that they're using is different, but the same principles and theories in governing those should govern, should govern social media. So I, so I think this is, this is when we start getting around Section 230. There shouldn't be a carve out for, for social media companies, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I think we, we start there. But the broader problem is, how do we make sure that we can separate fact from fiction anymore? When we were in school, we couldn't use a comic book as a private primary source mm -hmm. for something. Why, why, are we, why are we listening to some joker on, on YouTube that we don't even know who, who, who the, the real identity is? His real name is not Dragon Slayer 37, right? Like, so, 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 so that, that, that's, just, that's just some of my thoughts. Oh, and by the way, this is going to get even harder when, if you're looking at, you know, again, uh, I'm, I'm on a board of a company that's working on how al algorithms are being able to use natural language processing. And, and so, so th these are some of where these conversations are. But what the Democrats are proposing, um, I can't say I know the specifics of it. Okay. Yes, sir. We'll take, we'll take one, more, one or two more after this one. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, you mentioned in your talk like 35 and under folks are caring about climate. They're pro-LGBTQ, they're anti-racism, pro-international aid and order. Um, at the same time, it's clear to me, or it seems to me at least, the party is picking a social war, a cultural war. Mm -hmm against a lot of these same issues. So what do you kind of see as being the future of claiming a younger base for the Republican Party? And can fiscal policy really carry them through um, in the future term? Uh, so, so I would say, the, can fiscal policy carry them through? No, right? You got to address the things people care about. We had a debate this morning. Um, so Texas, we just had a primary. Only 3 million people voted. 1.8 
um, Republicans, 1.2 Democrats. Out of 30 million. Now, I can make the argument that a lot of that was because they, people didn't care or they were worried about other things. Could be taken as a good sign. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get somebody, somebody's opinion in here over there. And I agree, I, I agree with that concept. But people are obviously not coming out. And, and I've told this story before. Uh, the first time I participated in South by Southwest, the, um, the movie, music, and technology conference in Austin, Texas, I was on a panel with four YouTube stars. Their combined subscriber accounts, uh, the, 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 the number of subscribers combined for the four of them was one billion. Mm-hmm. I had 60. <laughs> and three of those 60 six are in up. this room. Six, yeah, six, six zero. Yeah, six, six zero. Six, not, zero. Not 60,000 yeah, or 60 million. Six zero. And three yeah. of them are in this room. Um, and, and the digital director for The Rock was one of the, the panelists. And this was when the movie Moana was coming out. And she said, if Moana fails at the box office, are we going to criticize the consumer, the moviegoers, or are we going to criticize the product, the movie? Right? No, I thought Moana was a delightful movie. I think it was successful at the box office. Um, and she says, um, but it's only in politics that you blame the consumer, the voter, versus the product, the politician. I actually think the opportunity, mm-hmm. the opportunity is talking about those things because more people believe that way, but we don't talk to them in our politics. You all know this, R or D, you talk to four or four Repub- primary voters, right? People that voted in four of the last four, Republican primary, Democratic primary. When those are the only people you are talking to, those are gonna be the only people that participate. And so but what I'm talking about is hard. Don't get me wrong. I know it because that's, that's how I had to win. Right? It's, it's funny, a lot of the Republican establishment always wants to take credit for me winning, right? But like, oh, we knew Will was going to be great. Uh, is that why you supported my opponents in the primary? You know? Um, and so, 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 so what I'm talking about is hard, but it's the opportunity. And guess what? We have to do it. Because when 72% of the country thinks the country is on the wrong track, and that's been a number that has been growing over the years, there's a better way to do things, right? And we don't have to accept the, the way things are. And that means talking and not being afraid of talking about things people care about. But it also means being a little bit in touch, which means you got to show up places that you've never been before and understand and learn. And that's ultimately why I wrote this. One last. Right, yes, sir. Sorry. You'll get the next one next year. So my question is about um, this idea of uh, gerontocracy, so rule of the old. Um, Rule of rules? Rule Rule of the the old. old. This is about uh, Pelosi and McConnell. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. I've never heard that phrase before. Uh, So the question is, as as you saw in the 2020 election, uh, we had two candidates in their late 70s, and also all the leadership, you know, Pelosi. I agree with you. Uh, I'm just going to add that, yeah, yeah. So what can be done um, to almost, as going on the last question, to almost make the make Congress more youthful, make it more in touch with the average American. Because the average American is 40 years old. They're yeah. not the average senator, which is in their 60s and 70s. Sure, I'm aware. So what can be done? So, so look, I, I, I appreciate this as, as the as last. What was your question? Just yell it out. Yeah, let's get your both too. too. Yes. Uh, so just on foreign policy, do you think that the damage to American credibility and reputation globally is reversible? And then on a... Like, with Russia Ukraine, even if we were to send Ukraine our heavy weaponry, the invasion of the Donbass has already begun. Can we actually change the trajectory? All right, we got two totally different questions, but let's do uh, them both. But, no, but, yeah, but, they're, but, they're, but they're related. That's they're good. related. That's good. Yes, is the short answer, right? Um, um, but here is, here, is, here is the fear the longer the invasion of Ukraine goes on, the worse it is for us. Because you're going to see our Eastern European allies um, have get these frustrations with their, um, because they have populations that are living under the threat of war. The closer you are to Russia, the more impactful um, uh, sanctions are on your day-to-day life. Oh, and by the way, there's a growing humanitarian crisis of, of, of humanitarian, uh, Ukrainians coming mm-hmm. to the country. Warsaw increased its population last month by 14%. Okay. 
it's hard for a government to deal with these things over time. So you're going to start seeing, the longer this goes, you're going to start seeing uh, some of those governments being pressured to start looking like Hungary, right? Vladimir Putin knows that. That's why I give the Ukrainians everything they can to lay the hammer down on, on Russia. If the Russians use a nuclear weapon, it is within their, their military doctrine. To, it's called um, escalate to de-escalate, where you use one, where you use one missile and, um, and everybody was supposed to calm down. Well, in 34 years of, of war gaming, guess what happened? Escalation led to escalation, and that's how mutually assured discretion came around. If Putin were to use one nuclear weapon, everybody would be against him, to include the Chinese. The Chinese would not support that. The 150 com- company, countries that have not been involved in, in Western sanctions against Russia would participate. So, you know, th- that, is, that is potentially out there. But this is how we attract and start talking to getting young, more young people involved. Talk about shit they care about. Pardon my language. I don't think this is on, on, on uh, broadcast. It's all over America. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, talk about things people care about, yeah. right? It's, it's, it, sounds, it sounds simple, but it's hard. Now, the, the cost for a politician to talk to people that don't... Um, um, a, a institute in Texas just did a poll... It's like 9% of Texans use Twitter. Nine. Nine. Yeah. Right? This, like, this notion that, that what's trending on Twitter is important or what's on cable news is what people care about. That's insane. It's not the case, right? And, and, the, and the, the notion that there's this one global narrative about what matters is, is, is it's, I think that's a major fallacy in what technology has led us into thinking that, oh, there's only one, uh, I can get into, I know we're, we're, we're late here, but um, like, we remember encyclopedias. You know, there was like multiple encyclopedias back in the day. Yeah, Britannica. Britannica, yeah. Funk and Wagnalls, yeah, that was yeah, my favorite because yeah, yeah. it had the word funk yeah, in it, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and you would turn to the same entry, and that entry would be directionally the same, but there would be a little different perspective, right? Because they had different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So my point is, it requires us that care about the country to get more involved. We all have to vote in primaries. This crowd is a sophisticated crowd. You probably do that. But do you get all your friends from high school to do that? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Does your family do that? And And it's a matter about getting engaged. Don't debate with them on who they should be voting. Make sure they're getting engaged and participating in the primary discussion. And let's start mimicking the behavior that we want to see. If we think social media is, is nasty and negative, are we contributing to that or trying to do something different? And, and, and then the, the second thing, and I'll, and, I'll end, and I'll end with this, Robert. We call this little thing, America, an experiment. Why? Nobody thought it was going to work. Everybody laughed at us. It wasn't until another 60 years that there was another democracy in the world, Switzerland. There's only 14 countries that have been a democracy for more than 100 years. We assume that democracy, of course, this is all we've ever known. This, of course it's going it's it's, it's to happen. Wrong. Democracy is fragile, and it requires us to engage at a level because we are fortunate to live in this place that we live in. So it's going to require leaders that are willing to inspire rather than fear monger. It's going to require leaders that are willing to make sure that what they say and what they do match. It's go- and it's going to require us to do that hard work to, to connect and to make sure that this, this experiment continues for another 247 years. I wish I had an easier plan for you on how to do this, but that's the opportunity. And I've learned that most politicians are best in the world following a trend. Nobody wants to be first, but nobody wants to be second, but people will fight each other to be third and fourth. And so I think this is where the opportunity is um, to be able to talk to a, a crowd just like this. So thanks for the question. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for listening in live stream. Thank you, Will, very much. It's been a great event. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.